this river became my teacher. Usually I walk in the open air where my thoughts can meander and my words can branch out. So let me imagine, let us imagine to be on this walk today. And in our walk, I'll start sharing about my source, where I come from, what teachings I got from this river, and how I see how drinkable rivers could be indicators for healthy ways of living. My birthplace is seven meters below sea, sea level, in the lowest point in the Netherlands, next to Rotterdam and next to the river, river Maas. I'm a confluence of a Dutch mother and a Chinese father. And in this stretch of cultures around the big globe, I have lived 10 years without a house, as a nomad and as a university teacher. For instance, at the Erasmus University, I've been taking students out next to the river Maas, bicycling, and we let the river and the salmon fish inform us about polluted rivers. That at some point, the salmon river was abundant, and at another point, they were totally gone. And that when policy changed, having the salmon river as a return, as an indicator, that after a few years, it returned. And in my work projects, I combine walking, and I go into the wild, and I survived. Big bonus. When I was 24, I had my first deep wilderness experience here, in this river, far in the subarctic north of Canada, in Quebec, where the Cree and the Inuit still live. For a month, I paddled source to sea the Rupert River. With a group, we protested the damming, the potential damming and diversion of this river. At the end of my walk, uh, no, canoe trip, this was a canoe trip. At the end, when I reached Washkaginish, the little town that is next to the inner sea of the James Bay, I could conclude that this entire river was drinkable. And that it was not only drinkable, it was vital. My hair got thicker, my eyes got better. For days, I didn't need to use my glasses anymore or my contact lenses. And what I learned from this river is that when all the relationships are healthy, the bedding of the river, the bank, the entire watershed, then qualities like drinkability and vitality emerge. And I also learned that like the river, the land flows. And either side, land or river, Everything matters, and that this flow cannot be broken. Three years later, though, only three years later, I returned to this river. The rock bedding, where I had been picnicking three years before, had been exploded by dynamite. The preparations for the damming of the river had started. Fish got poisoned. Mercury was found in the water. The local people who have been for thousands of years been eating this fish got ill eating the fish and drinking the water. How is it possible that these decisions are being made that a once millions of years of drinkable river and a living landscape of healthy relationship, of an entire food chain that is coherent, that it gets lost. How can we make these decisions? So, our societal norms, one of which is now private property, that there's no such thing almost anymore as the commons that we take care of together, is lost. And another is that these indicators of our economic thinking are dominated by the amount of euros or dollars put into a project and are generated from a project, the amount of jobs created, 
the GDP, the gross domestic product, the amount of goods and services going around in the system. Nationally, all these indicators go up. But locally, a whole lifeline of healthy relationships, of a living landscape, get broken, get lost. And not only here locally, this is locally worldwide. So what we see, what the symptoms are of this behavior, is that two-thirds of our fish are now gone, both in rivers and in oceans. We have destroyed the habitats, and we've been overfishing. And we don't, it, this is not only with the fish, this is with the reptiles, the amphibians, the birds, the butterflies, our minerals in the soil. So also our food, two-thirds less. And even more of our flying insects, we recently learned, three-quarters of our flying insects are gone. Gone! And not only biodiversity, 80% of the worldwide human population is faced with a threat to security of water issues, either too much, too little, or too polluted. One example was a place where there was a lack of water. People were desperate. It was earlier this year in Kenya. People were killing animals, each other, because since June the year before, so almost a year, there was no water there. No drop of water had fallen. And this as a result, pastoralism, that is this grazing with all the goats and sheep, um, they didn't have any, any more vegetation, but still they continue, There's, there are masses of them, and being desperate, no water. They've been plundering farms, nature reserves. It was a shock to see that people and farms were destroyed right where I was, in this desperate element of water. And on top of this, we spent now, they have estimated, that the past 10 years and the coming 15 years, over a time of 25 years, that we spend 20 trillion, that's 12 zeros, of creating this infrastructure of repairing and maintaining and of purifying water. So it's a whole industry, there's a lot of stakes. And this 20 trillion, yeah, what, what does that mean? That is like the, the total US debt, or 17 times the EU budget annually this year. So we have been treating our rivers like a sewage system, like a waste dump, rather than acknowledging it's a lifeline, an artery, pumping the heart of our living systems. So what can we do? So I think that if we change those indicators that are navigating us right now in this direction of this two-thirds of loss of life, and sign of unhealthy relationship, if we change it to simple and engaging indicators, like drinkable rivers, drinkable rivers could be this guide leading us to this healthy relationship, then we might get there. And this is simple, any child could, could test, are we on the track towards drinkable water? Is it drinkable? This is river mass water. Or is it not yet drinkable? Or are we even going, polluting it more? A child can measure it. And I'll engage children in my walks to uh, indicate it. And it's en engaging because we are water. 70%, so 45 kilos of approximately of bottles of water are standing here as well. 80% uh, is our head, is water. So we are it. So also the quality of what we are drinking, we become. And we need it every day. One time I was walking uh, from Mexico to Canada and I went 
uh, in in the Anzego Borrego forest for uh, the desert for about a month. And I started very, feeling very rich with nine kilos of drinking water with me. But soon it goes down to only one and a half, or half even. And then you have to make a decision. Do I use it to hydrate my dehydrated food? And you're very hungry when you walk like a marathon a day. And, um, or are you going to use it for water or for hygiene? Of course, you use it for water. But to, to have that feeling of the emotion of needing it, you understand then the desperation that I saw in Kenya. So these delicate interdependencies of creating, taking care of this lifeline on the one hand, and the vulnerability and the necessity on the other hand, and the simplicity of checking it on a daily basis, I think drinkable rivers could be this indicator for um, healthy ways of living. So, how can we care? Well, I will start to walk source to sea rivers. And I'll start with the river Mass that is r r running right here. Remember our imaginary walk? So we, we can see to the side, we can see the river Mass. That's why this, this is a symbol. And um, so I'll start in France and finish at my birthplace in the North Sea in Rotterdam. And I will engage any of you, local people, and organizations. For instance, an organization that I invited, or that we've been walking with, has been Triodos Bank. And this bank saw the, the opportunity that they have for adopting this idea. And this walking culminated in that now there is a proposal sent to the Dutch Central Bank with the title Drinkable rivers as indicator for healthy economy. So it's very exciting. So I'm going to soon sit with more the indicator and metrics geeks to see how can we make the translation. And it, the walks with the local people and with you will inform how, how do we do that? How do we translate from drinkable rivers as a vision to making it real. And what can you do? Ask yourself what you deeply care about. What is, who is your river next to you? And where is your drinking water come from? And what makes your heart sing? This is a bundle of questions, but it, it leads you to the same kind of enthusiasm. Because this was my teachings I got from the river. Thank you, Rupert River. And I now invite you to visit your river close to you and see and share what teachings you got from that river. Because wouldn't it be magical if we can all drink from rivers anywhere in the world like this, knowing that this is a spin-off for biodiversity, soil buildup, climate stabilization, that the rivers are happy, that you are healthy for now and for future generations. Thank you. <laughs> Join the spot. Thank you. <laughs> Leanne, thank you so much for that. Now, you've really literally taken me by the shoulders and you've literally, like a doctor, almost taken me and shaken me and said, your arteries are clogged. And not only are they clogged, they're filled with poison. If you can summarize in one sentence that urgent call, what would you tell the people in the audience today? Thank water before you use it. Ladies and gentlemen. Good. Remember. Thank you.